good. Okay, well, I say we start. Um, so welcome everybody to this discussion, presentation and discussion um, a, a called A Rule to Walk By, organized by the Partnership of Historic Bostons, as you know. Um, we are looking at, you know, the first among of the entire British world, the first Bill of Rights, primarily, the uh, Body of Liberties. And it's a remarkable document, as I'm sure you know from reading it, but it was completely ahead of its time. It was ahead of the levelers, who were the kind of radical wing of the Puritans in England who fought, who were part of the Civil War after this was written. But it also made, you know, it's chock full of assumptions about who is in society, who has rights, who doesn't have rights, and why. And so I believe that's what Roxanne wants to take us through, to look at these assumptions and think about, you know, what, what are they assuming? What is implicit in this incredible language? And therefore, I think there are two ways that this is relevant now. One is that, as we all know, voting rights, rights in general, are under siege around the world, not least in the United States you know, and in Europe, but pretty much everywhere. So that makes this document particularly important, I think, because it is a clear bill of rights, giving in, you know, protecting individual rights and expanding them on the one hand, showing also that a constitution can restrict it, can restrict your rights. But the other way it's relevant is by looking at their assumptions, we can see that we might have some too. And so it behooves us to look at what we're assuming today when we talk about voting rights or any rights at all. So I'm going to hand you over to Roxanne in just a minute, introduce her first, but a few housekeeping things first. One is this session is being recorded and you will be able to see it should you long to watch it for a second time. Uh, on our new website under events sometime over the weekend. And so you can share that link, you can tell your friends, whatever you want. So, so you know, have a look anyway, have a look at our website. Um, the structure of this evening is going to be Roxanne presenting for about half an hour. And then she's going to break us into small groups for discussion. She'll give us some kickoff questions and then we'll be in small groups. And then, then you will, somebody will report back to the whole group and then we'll open for a whole everybody pitch in. So you can ask questions in one of two ways. Either you could just speak up, which would be great, nice to hear your voices, or you can put it in the chat, which is at the bottom of the screen. And one of us will then raise that with Roxanne so, so that we're not missing anything. Um, I think then I just need to introduce, say a few words about Roxanne so you know what you're up against here. And um, how creatively she's going to lead this group. She is a board member. She's a trustee of the Partnership of Historic Bostons. And, uh, and may I say, she's a demon knitter as well. She knits through our meetings. So. Um, she specializes in 17th and 18th century Scottish Highland society. That is, you know, her love. Um, she is a B in anthropology from the University of Vermont. And then she went to the University of Edinburgh, where she did an MA in Celtic studies, and then got her PhD at Harvard, also in Celtic, Celtic languages, excuse me, and literature, at the same time that she worked at the Peabody, the Anthropology Museum. So she, she knows her onions. Um, by day, she wrote to me, so that's <laughs> sort of a super woman approach. She does low income public policy and um, community outreach for a group called Action by Boston Community Development. For, but, but for about three decades, she's also taught. And she tells me that she calls herself the Sesame Street professor. And that is because most of her topics began with the letter A. So anthropology, archaeology, art history, astronomy, uh, but she's now branching out into other letters, geology, geography, Massachusetts history, now to this, this semester to critical thinking. So her goal, or our goal, I should say, but is to stimulate us all to think critically and talk heartily, talk up a storm to each other about these two seminal uh, 17th century law codes and and how they're embedded in our society. There's their assumptions and then 
you know, what does it mean for us today? So I'm going to hand you over to Roxanne now. Thank you very much, Sarah. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm normally um, paying attention to 17th century Scottish Highlands, but I'm also fascinated by the 17th and 18th century here in Massachusetts. I'm gonna bring up um, a PowerPoint presentation. So we're gonna do this classic share screen for a moment. And then because I need to actually click play afterwards, here we are with the rule to walk by. Let's look at law and social status in 17th century Massachusetts. Here, where most many of us are, but with Zoom, I know we've got people from Boston, England. We've got people from all over. So, oh, yeah, so now I have to figure out how I do my next shift. Sorry, nope, that does not want to. This is the problem with actually doing it on Zoom. I want to do return. Nope, I have to figure out how to get into the page. Sorry about that. There we go. So, the general laws of Massachusetts started with a preamble. For a commonwealth without laws is like a ship without rigging. And I can't read my next bit because we're on Zoom. Pardon me again, sorry. This is the challenge with doing a full screen presentation. Uh, well, steering. Yeah, so I'm just going to have to guess on part of my writing here. For a commonwealth without laws is like a ship without rigging and steering. This hath been no small privilege and advantage to us to New England and our churches. Uh, no, this is not going to work. Hang on for a second, folks. I am actually going to, apologies on this. As you've figured out, we are all having challenges. There we go. With... Um, this for the presenter, um, Zoom covers part of the screen, not for you in watching this. So there we go, I can now see my full screen. For a commonwealth without laws is like a ship without rigging and steering. This has been no small privilege and advantage to us in New England, that our churches and civil state have been planted and grown up like two twins not only to gather our churches and set up the ordinances of Christ Jesus, but also withal to frame our civil polity and laws according to the rules of his most holy word, whereby each do help and strengthen other. The church is the civil authority and the civil authority the churches, and so both prosper the better. This is the preamble to the general laws, one of the two texts that we're looking at tonight and that I'm really hoping we will all discuss together. So our goal is to explore primary sources, not to go and read what other people have interpreted, not to go through intermediaries and articles on sources, but instead go straight to the primary sources and to tease out the rules which you ought to walk by. That is, how 17th century New England social structure and thought appears in these two sources. James, if you could put up in the chat for people, if they haven't already had a link to the Body of Liberties in the Book of General Laws, if you could put the links in the chat and folks can follow along here if you don't have a printout or something already there. So Massachusetts and really New England's earliest law codes are the Body of Liberties in 1641, probably the seminal text that we're looking at tonight, and then the later revision from 1648, the Book of General Laws and Liberties Concerning the Inhabitants of Massachusetts. How did these law codes that we're looking at come about? In 17th century Massachusetts Bay Colony, well, people felt the need, people were actually clamoring for a written law code. They wanted their personal liberties protected in writing. They also wanted a curtailing of the magistrate's power. 
the magistrates were those elected officials who served at the General Court of Massachusetts. And you can actually see here in the corner the General Court. Today, the Massachusetts legislature is the General Court. It is still its formal name is the General Court. In the 1700s, the General Court was the seat of both administrative and judicial power in Massachusetts Bay Colony. And people were really rather frustrated with those magistrates, even though the leader and magistrate John Winthrop worried that by putting conditions and strictures, laws and writing, worried that it would actually alert London authorities that um, Mass Bay was rather going against English law here across the Atlantic. Um, and John was also fearing that, you know, putting laws in writing would rather straitjacket the judges, that is, the magistrates, such as him. Oops, and now we're not going again to the next one. Sorry, folks, let me... There we go, okay. So the first attempt at putting a law code together was done by John Cotton. Reverend John Cotton in 17, 1636 put together Moses, his judicials. You can tell by the name that it's primarily biblically based. Cotton based it on the book of Leviticus, all those thou, thou shalt nots, and Exodus. Not only was it short and only really based on the Bible, not on English custom, but it didn't curtail the power of the magistrates. So the general court tried again and again from 1635 to 1640. There were multiple general court appointed committees of magistrates to craft some laws that would be agreeable to the word of God, which might be the fundamentals of this commonwealth. So in 1641, the body of liberties was pulled together. It's a list of liberties. It's a list of rights rather than restrictions to guide that Massachusetts General Court of Judges. Not surprisingly, perhaps, it's actually written by one person and not a committee. Nathaniel Ward, a good Puritan, son of a Puritan minister, well-educated in Emmanuel College, a lawyer himself, immigrated to Massachusetts in 1634. He was the one who was finally tasked to pull together a list of liberties. In fact, and did that and eventually went back to England again for good. He based the liberties on rights. This is what is so novel. Also drew upon Cotton's draft of the criminal, of the book of Leviticus for the criminal code in the body of liberties. The general court um, wrote out copies of the body, circulated them for review around Massachusetts Bay towns for about a year. And then in 1641, the court provisionally adopted around about 98 or 100 liberties or so. It doesn't actually come out to exactly 100, although that's what a lot of um, the secondary sources claim. It's hard to count actually how many liberties there are. Interestingly, the general court never actually printed up the document for formal dissemination. So that's why the copy that we have is here, this manuscript, courtesy of the Boston Athenaeum. And then over the next seven years, guess what? More general court committees to review what was working and what wasn't working, what needs re needed revising in the body of liberties. And in 1648, some seven years later, the general court came out with the book of the general laws and liberties concerning the inhabitants of Massachusetts. And again, you can look in the chat to see the connection to that if you don't already have it. This is really a much more pragmatic and comprehensive law code than the body of liberties. It's arranged at this point alphabetically rather than num numbered rights, and it's separated into misdemeanors and felonies. It revises that unpublished body of liberties, dropping out some provision, adding in others that had been adopted by the colony over the years, but keeping 86 liberties from the original body. Rather than the novel list of rights, it takes the structure of a much more traditional English legal handbook. In fact, the general court had bought, ordered several handbooks for them to look at so that they could figure out, they could gain better light for making and proceeding about laws. 
And this time, as you can see, the general court actually printed up and sent out copies of their book of general laws. It's the structure of the body of liberties, however, that I find personally extra fascinating. I find it socially revealing. And as an anthropologist, I'm really interested in how people think about their society. So let's take a deeper dive into the body of liberty's structure. If I can again, it's not changing. Ah, I see what I have to do. Okay, so the body of liberty starts with 17 basic civil liberties. And by the way, this was very much kept in the general laws. It's the first entry in the general laws also. No man's life shall be taken away. No man's honor or good name shall be stained. No man's person shall be arrested, restrained, banished, dismembered, nor in any ways punished. No man shall be deprived of his wife or children. No man's goods or estate shall be taken away from him, nor in any way damaged under color of law or countenance of authority, unless it be by virtue or equity of some express law of the country, warranting the same established by a general court and sufficiently published or in case of the defect of a law in any particular case, by the wor word of God, the laws of the Bible. And in capital cases, or in cases concerning dismembering or banishment, according to that word, to be judged by the general court. Then it goes on to a very large section, 40 individual numerated rights and rules concerning judicial proceedings. Because remember, this is really the body of liberties is the instruction to the general court on how to be judges. For example, no man's person shall be restrained or imprisoned by any authority whatsoever before the law hath sentenced him thereto, if he can put it in sufficient security, bail or main prize. I think that probably is man price, another meaning of man price for his appearance and good behavior in the meantime, unless it be in capital crimes and contempts in open court, and in any such cases where some express act of court doth allow it. So that's 40 rights. Then the next section of the body of liberties is 20 enumerated liberties, more particularly concerning the freeman. Starts with all free men called to give any advice, vote, verdict, or sentence in any court or civil assembly shall have full freedom to do it according to their true judgments and consciences, so it be done orderly and inoffensively in manner, for the manner. That wasn't kept in the general laws, even though I think it was still very much people felt it was applicable. After 20 liberties for freemen, and I think I managed to skip my side and slide and who the freemen are. So let me go back if I can um, and just explain who the freemen are. The freemen were those males of high social standing, not servants or indentured servants or workers who had membership in the church in the Puritan church who had been voted in as members of the church because they had been redeemed by God and who therefore had the right to vote to elect the magistrates. That's who the freemen are. After that, one has two explicit liberties of women, such as here, if any man at his death shall not leave his wife a competent portion of his estate, upon complaint made to the general court, she shall be relieved, she shall get some relief. After 20 liberties for freemen, two liberties for all women, followed by four liberties of children, also dealing with inheritance, such as when parents die intestate, having no heirs male of their bodies, their daughters shall inherit as co-partners unless the general court upon just reason shall judge otherwise. The general laws actually don't have any inheritance rules in them. Kind of a disappointment to me as an anthropologist. I adore inheritance stuff. I think it tells me so much about the society. 
after liberties of children come four enumerated liberties of servants, such as number 88, which does appear, by the way, in the general laws. Servants that have served diligently and faithfully to the benefit of their masters seven years shall not be sent away empty. And if anybody, if any have been unfaithful, negligent, or unprofitable in their service, in their seven-year contract or other contract, notwithstanding the good usage of their masters, they shall not be dismissed till they have made satisfaction according to the judgment of authority. That did make it into the general laws. The next section after servants, after freemen, women, children, servants, are three liberties of foreigners and strangers. And I'm going to keep that separate. I'm not going to dive into that right now because we will, in a few minutes, be doing a much deeper dive into one of those liberties that I find fascinating. Finally, for the main section of the body of liberties, after strangers and foreigners, there's two rights of the brute creatures. And these were not kept in the general laws. This particular one wasn't, at least. No man, for instance, shall exercise any tyranny or cruelty towards any brute creature which are usually kept for man's use. Really a very separate section, and taken straight from John Cotton's Moses' Judicials, are the 12 capital laws, the capital punishment laws. These are all kept verbatim in the general laws such as number two, famous here in Massachusetts, if any man or woman be a witch, that is, hath or consulteth with a familiar spirit, they shall be put to death. And finally, the last separate section of the body of liberties, there's 11 and a few more, um, basically rules liberties governing the church, a declaration of the liberties the Lord Jesus hath given to the churches. This section is also not in the general laws, I think because the general laws actually don't address churches particularly at all. Um, this is felt to be a separate type of law. Every church, for instance, hath full liberty of election and ordination of their officers from time to time, provided they be able, pious, and orthodox. This, it seems to me, is a direct response to the situation the Puritans had found themselves in England, one of the major reasons they fled um, across to the to what they called New England, which is the territory of the native peoples of Massachusetts and other native tribes. Um, the Church of England was not permitting Puritan um, worshipers to appoint their own officers, church officers, and this is directly responding to that. And then there's three final empowering clauses, not kept in the general laws, because these are really sort of more empowering clauses. Howsoever these above specified rights, freedoms, immunities, authorities, and privileges, both civil and ecclesiastical, are expressed only under the name and title of liberties and not in the exact form of laws or statutes. Yet we do with one consent fully authorized and earnestly entreat all that are and shall be an authority to consider them as laws and not to fail to inflict condign, meaning appropriate, and proportionable punishments upon every man impartially that shall infringe or violate any of them. The structure of the body of liberties fascinates me as an anthropologist. I see it as very much echoing the great chain of being. This is a medieval and early modern European, not native, mental concept that you can see illustrated here. It's really a major social assumption about where people and animals fall in the world. You can see here that God is the all-powerful, the all-perfect, the all-good. Underneath God, come the angels, underneath angels come man, come humans. In a slightly different version layout of the um, chain of being, you can see that men are closer and more perfect and more like God than women are, children underneath that. 
underneath humans are the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, the brute beasts of the land. They come under humans, are further away from God. Finally, at the base, and base is the word for it, is the devil. The Puritans and other Europeans presumed that hierarchy was natural and completely inherent in the world and in society. It was patently clear to them that all men are not created equal. I see this as one of the major assumptions embedded in the structure of the body of liberties. I'd like to go finally to one particular liberty that fascinates me for another very overt thing that it says. This is that liberties of foreigners and strangers that I skipped before. It's number 91. This is actually the passage, you can see it here, that first brought me to the body of liberties. It's a passage that's kept verbatim in the general laws where it appears under B for bond slavery. There shall never be any bond slavery villainage or captivity amongst us unless that tiny little word unless that spelt so much misery in Massachusetts unless it be lawful captives taken in just wars and such strangers as willingly sell themselves or are sold to us and these shall have all the liberties and Christian usages which the law of God established in Israel concerning such persons, you know, the law of God doth morally require. This exempts none from servitude who shall be judged thereto by authority. Word the same in both the body of liberties and the general laws. Slavery has a deep and complex history in Massachusetts. Today, we pride ourselves in Massachusetts as having been the state that first outlawed slavery. But you just saw in number 91 of the Body of Liberties that Massachusetts was also the first place, the first state, the first colony, the first place in New England, the first place in all of the colonies that made slavery legal. There's a decided trend over the 17th century that I'd like to review here in what is unfortunately a rather packed slide. In 1637, Captain Pierce, whose house you can actually see behind me in my um, backdrop behind me, that's Captain Pierce's house. He was the captain of the ship Desire and he takes a cargo of captive Pequot native people who have been captured in war to sell as slaves in the Caribbean. This is really what underlies that, claw, that law number 91, that the colonists had been enslaving native peoples here in Massachusetts well before um, 1641. A few months later, after Pierce has sold the Pequot peoples, he returns to Boston in the desire with enslaved Africans in the hold of the ship for sale from Bermuda with enslaved African people. How did the general court feel about this? Well, in 1639, the general court voted to reimburse the man who bought those enslaved Africans off the desire because the general court felt that that purchase was really a public investment for giving Massachusetts a good body of cheap menial labor. It gets complex again. In 1645, the captain of the Rainbow imported two enslaved Africans whom the captain and the Rainbow ship had basically lifted from their village in West Africa. The general court, in turn, charged the captain with man stealing. That's capital crime number 10, by the way. Um, and orders those men who had been invol involuntarily taken from their village to be returned to West Africa. But then in 1650, the Saugus Iron Works, a corporation here in Massachusetts Bay, um, 
purchases the seven-year indentures and therefore the bodies of Scottish prisoners of war who had been taken captive at the Battle of uh, Dunbar in Scotland and who had been transported over here to uh, Boston and Salem, as Saugus was then known, um, transported involuntarily. They were sold to the Saugus Iron Works. In 1659, the general court sentences two Quaker youths to be sold into slavery in Bermuda. Interestingly, they're not because the general court couldn't find any um, ship captain who was actually willing to take these Christian youths over to Bermuda to be enslaved. However, then in 1670, the general court permits that children of slaves who are here, children who are not foreigners or strangers, but are born of enslaved African people, that those children can be enslaved and sold also. Complex. That's what excites me about the Body of Liberties. What excites you in these two primary texts, the Body of Liberties and the General Laws? Look at this, and we'll put these questions in the chat also. What overt messages about 17th century New England society and its inv individuals, Puritan and perhaps other groups too, do you think that the texts are conveying? What do you see in them? Not what others have seen in them, what do you see in them? And what implicit assumptions have you spotted that are embedded in these texts? I see social structure and the great chain of being. I'm fascinated by the way slavery is legalized. What do you see? Because it's really enough now what I've done, what I've been talking on, enough of me as one person. Let's now get talking together. In a few moments, we're gonna let people go into smaller breakout rooms of about seven or eight or so people a piece where you can talk, chat amongst yourselves. I am going to stop the sharing, if I can do this, yep, go back to the Zoom, there we go. Um, and we'll go into breakout rooms. And let's see, do we have James? Yes, there's the questions from James in the chat now that I can see it. I can't see any of the chat when I'm doing the full screen presentation. In the breakout rooms, Chat amongst yourselves, pull out the texts, say what fascinates you, what caught your attention, what you think is embedded in there. Think of questions, see if you can figure out answers. I found through this past year of teaching with Zoom that it's in the breakout rooms that people really get chatting an awful lot. And what we're doing here are discussions, not lectures, even though I admit I've just lectured for a little bit too long with that. So you'll have coming up on your screen um, an invitation to join a breakout room. Say yes to it. The breakout room will, and the breakout room um, will be for about 12 to 15 minutes. We'll put these questions up again in it. And then we'll ask for people to just share what you're chatting about in, the, in it later. Hmm. And we'll see if anybody's having troubles and there goes James putting in the questions into the breakout room. If you're not seeing an invitation, let us know and we can manually try to put you into that or another breakout room. This is what I've discovered with some of my students, especially those who may be zooming in through a cell phone. It can be a bit tricky. I see we've got some here. Can people unmute themselves right now, James? Um, yes, people should be able to unmute yep. themselves. So if you don't see an invite, let us know and we can try to individually put you into the rooms. There we go, everybody's popping back. So 
one of my personal markers of yes, it's been a good conversation is when people don't come back before the 59 second countdown clock <laughs> simply yanks them back to the main room. It's because, like, no, no, we don't want to go back into the main room. We want to talk here, damn it. Um, so I'm glad you guys were all talking. Thanks for putting up with us for technical difficulties. This is the first time that we've done um, breakout rooms for discussion um, because we really wanted everybody mm. to mm. discuss and talk. That's what the heart of these events are, is not one person talking, not one person sort of being the be it all, know it all, which I certainly mm -hmm. am not with this, um, but getting the exchange between people. So we had a number of very rich rooms. We also had like one or two rooms where just didn't quite, actually people didn't quite go into. Um, <laughs> we've got about 25 more minutes before we do the final wrap up and tell you guys what we're doing next um, for the partnership in a few, in about a month or so. Um, does any room want to share some of the great questions, topics, thoughts, wonders that you guys came up with. <laughs> Let's try to do some sharing. Try to make it fairly concise so that others can also share, please. And you can pop it into the chat if you want to, too. Did any rooms have rousing debates going on? You have to unmute yourself in order to talk. We had a little bit of a rousing debate. I mean, some, but I, I'm going to have a hard time. So I'll need correction from members of our group. I forget which we were in, six, I think. Um, that, that, so um, I think it was felt by one person very strongly that this was all about interpreting biblical law in the, in the widest sense. And, and I, I think that's true. They were here. They were godly people and they were here on a godly mission. There's no question. But I tended to emphasize much more the legal uh, antecedents, the Magna Carta that John Winthrop refers to and the petition of right and the experience that everybody was having. You know, um, Nathaniel Ward himself just having been excommunicated by Ward, by uh, Laud, Archbishop Laud, and having to leave the country. So oh, is that why he came over here? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. His brother also was getting in trouble. So, um, so I think there's a really strong element of common law, but that development of a sense of individual rights and a fight against tyranny that they mm. experienced in England very clear. And if you read about what happened under Charles I and Laud, you know this is tyranny. Oh, no. You know, so... Um, well, somebody's looking puzzled by that, but where they feared it would happen, they wanted to protect against that happening. So I think I'm not, I, my side is, I'm not dismissing the biblical side of it at all, but I think we have to remember the other part and the way they merged the two, the Calvinist tradition and the, and the rights tradition in, in England. So one of the great things about these texts is that there's so much in them that you can trace all sorts of themes and you can sort of, and this is where I think as, as scholars, it's really great fun. You can, you can sort of emphasize different things depending on what you're interested in. For me as an anthropologist, you saw I went straight to that social structure and frankly ignored most of the religious stuff with it because I have a problem getting interested in the religious stuff. That's what I really need to work on next. <laughs> Jessica's got a really interesting point here, pointing out that in the chat that there was a real lack of recognition of the indigenous peoples um, of the land which the Englishmen were expanding into. Did other people feel that too, that where were native peoples and recognition of them as human yeah. beings mm -hmm. in those texts? Yeah, we, we spoke a little bit about it. Uh, uh, I brought up the difference between Plymouth and uh, Mass Bay Colony. And there were, uh, uh, Plymouth had uh, uh, at least a good 20 years of reasonably respectful relationships uh, yeah. uh, with the Poconoka tribe. Uh, it wasn't until uh, Josiah took over in the uh, 1640s and uh, uh, then um, uh, Philip 
uh, uh, who the two of them never got along, and and things uh, went south uh, pretty quickly over that period of time. But Boston had, uh, I mean, basically they were just ignoring the the native population here. There weren't many of them when they arrived. Uh, they didn't have to deal with them, uh, and it was a, a major difference between uh, what was going on in 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 Boston and and what was going on in Plymouth. Do mothers have thoughts on the relationships with the native peoples here in the the sort of the greater what we now think of as the greater Boston, Massachusetts area? I would just area? say that they were here. Um, the uh, along the Nepo the Neponset band was here in in this time still through the all the thirties anyway and into the forties I think, um, and they they did interact with them. And note that the Boston the um, Mass Bay Colony went south. Away, so the, the Boston Peninsula didn't have many Native Americans, but all around it did. At the northern banks of the Mystic, there's a Squaw Sachem. Um, there were the Neponset. Massachusetts was the um, the tribal chair, um, the tribal the head of the tribe. At um, so it, it was um, there was uh, there were a lot of uh, natives around, um, just not maybe where the seat of government was. There's an excellent book that is, I can see from where I'm sitting here, it's on the sofa of my house. This Land is Their Land by, by um, that book is excellent, um, about the movie. Native peoples. And also um, we have other books in our newly, re newly done up revised website um, under resources. This is a shameless wow. plug for super books and super website um, on Native people. Um, mm -hmm. There were a lot of natives around, but my God, I will say my ancestors, because my ancestors, the ones who were the Quakers who were enslaved, came over in the 1630s and they were ignoring, I think, native peoples too with that. And I think that it, to Jessica's point, because um, I was in that group with her, that, that brought it up. <laughs> it, it's significant that, you know, the way that the, uh, the Boston area of the Massachusetts Bay Colony decided to deal with indigenous people was to first put them in praying villages and convert them to you know to catholicism or to christianity in order to make them part of this sort of society other than that um i, I think that to to david's point they were pretty much ignored and if you look at that uh if you look at the text there it's really if you want to say they consider them foreigners which is an interesting thing to call them foreigners in their own land but but i to your point roxanne they were pretty much ignored yeah. Um, in, the, in, the, in the context of the fact that you had these people coming over from a foreign country to a land where they, that was already inhabited, but had no mention of the people who were here. So that's very telling. Yeah. And it still continues to be that way in many ways in terms of how we as Americans deal with the indigenous people who still are here and we don't, we don't acknowledge them unless they are recognized by the federal government, yes. which is exactly the same process as bringing them into praying villages and recognizing by the Massachusetts Bay mm -hmm. Colony. There's no difference. Could, could I say something though? So what is fascinating is that there's not a single mention of native people in this whole document. It, it, that, unless it is that they're, they're strangers and foreigners is but it's not I, but to say that they were ignored I mean by this time you've had the Pequot war with how many hundreds of people killed thousands, probably thousands and then hundreds enslaved John Winthrop had a Native American slave uh, you know so there was plenty of acquaintance and people in and out of villages and homes together. So it is a strange, it is a really strange omission. Well, Sarah, I, when we, when I meant ignored, I didn't mean yeah. ignored that there wasn't interaction. I meant ignored relative to these writings to any mention of them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in yeah. the context of any bills or any of those things, there was nothing until, you know, until, um, until Eliot translates the Bible and they decide that there's going to be a legislative action to yeah. convert indigenous people yeah. or the heathens to Christianity. But what we were talking about was ignored in context to the actual stuff that we've been reading. So to your point, they're not mentioned at all within that. But yes, there was obviously interaction. There were plenty of skirmishes. We know from the last presentation we did, there were always issues around land and, and, and livestock and all those things mm -hmm. but ignored formally in the writing. 
in many ways, as people were looking at women and children, women and children with that two rights for women, four rights for children, which is really protecting their rights, protecting their property rights, if the sort of the standard inheritance wasn't there, they were otherwise pretty much ignored formally too. Yeah. And this fits, I think, into this great chain of being idea, which I'm certain unconsciously, if not consciously, my Puritan ancestors would have said, Native peoples, well, they're further down the great chain of being. Yeah, than exactly. um, it's a really pernicious European attitude, by the way. Yeah. There's, there's an opinion on my part, but I think it's pernicious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because you would expect people in a new land uh, to say, uh, by the way, we're a little different from England because we've learned this from being here in America. But maybe they couldn't admit that because they couldn't. They'd be in trouble for deviating from England because they were still part of it. Yeah, they certainly, I mean, they thought of themselves as Englishmen. I mean, this is renamed as New England from it. Um, there was an interesting question or comment about people were talking about children. And I'm trying to find that in the chat here. Um, somebody want to bring up what you guys were, your group was talking about children? David Weed was talking, to, saying he's interested in how children are regarded. Yeah, uh, it was a, a little difficult. We talked uh, principally about uh, uh, children who uh, whose parents had died and mm -hmm. what happened to them. Uh, I made the point that uh, children's value primarily uh, had to do with their labor. And that, uh, you know, once they were five or six years old and could contribute to the labor of the family, uh, they were con considered valuable. So if your parents died for any reason, chances were very good that another family would take you in. Uh, it, it, uh, it wasn't necessarily, uh, you know, the way we do it today with uh, foster parenting and things of that sort. But uh, uh, the fact that you can contribute to labor meant that uh, other families uh, would consider you uh, valuable property. Right. <laughs> you right. in, in fact, the um, Liberty number 84, which is the final one for the four children, says, no orphan during their minority, meaning a child, no parents, they are not yet at least not yet 14 and perhaps 21 there. No orphan during their minority, which was not committed to tuition or service in their lifetime, meaning that weren't placed actually in another household to serve, mm. shall afterwards be absolutely disposed of by any kindred, friend, executor, township, or church, nor by themselves without the consent of some court, wherein two assistants at least shall be present. But it looks like the standard practice was you're an orphan, you know, hopefully there's kin to take you in. If there's not, let's see where we can place you. So you have a roof over your head. You learn some trade, hopefully, and you can be a good servant. Mm -hmm. I won't say that this is quite unusual these days, or at least recently either. My mother-in-law was orphaned during the Depression. Here, actually, I'm in Malden, Massachusetts, actually, um, even if the house looks like I'm in Winthrop, Massachusetts, behind me. Um, my mother-in-law was orphaned and was placed into uh, her aunt's household and hated it bitterly because she felt that she was essentially there entirely as a Cinderella. Mm. That was in the 1930s after her father had died from effects of World War I mustard gas and her mother had died. Well, the, the other factor was male children who wouldn't necessarily then be uh, inherit uh, from the the family to whom they were assigned. <laughs> what oh, right. So that that was a big factor. Yeah, I've done a lot of this work in Scottish stuff. The the New England stuff is entirely new to me, but that's what I teased out a lot of in Scottish laws and legal documents. What other areas did people find fascinating? I think uh, in our group, there was one person, maybe she'll talk about it, who was surprised at the number of slaves that were in uh, the Puritan environment and how they started importing them, both Indian slaves 
as well as black slaves. Uh, I think that's been sort of, it's a given, but it's not been talked about very much. So here in Greater Boston area, Greater Boston, Massachusetts area, we have the uh, Royal House in Medford with its slave quarters still there and they do a great deal of interpreting and, and you know, discussing and making over it and obvious the slavery there. A lot of slavery. I have another book that I can see over on my sofa. It's where a lot of my books have been piled because um, we sort of ran out of bookcase space like three years or four years ago. It hasn't stopped us from buying any more books in this house. But there's another book that is in the resource list on um, slavery here in Massachusetts that people should take a look at. Royal House isn't really a perfect example because apparently most of the slaves were house slaves in, and so people might have a couple of slaves, right. but not very many. That's right. It wasn't like the giant southern plantations. <laughs> Which have given, I would say, the name plantation an extra oh, bad yeah. connotation. Yeah. Did you spot in one of the um, early, I think, preamble that I read where it mentioned, um, you know, we have been planted here? That was the standard verb to plant, meaning to colonize, to settle a place. Um, and so a plantation is not per se a place where there is enslavement. It is a place that is a colony where, where in this case, English have come and planted themselves in what they saw as a new fertile place to live. I hope everybody knows that uh... Rhode Island just uh, got rid of yeah. the, the plantation. Word plantation. We used to have the longest name for the shortest state, but now we're just Rhode Island. <laughs> now you're kind of boring. <laughs> no. And Plymouth is now Plymouth Patuxet instead of Plymouth Plantation. That's right. Yes, because of that plantation huh. has gotten an extra horrendous connotation of yeah. slavery, which again, as we've been discussing, is not that there was not slavery here in New England, uh, was and plantation is a, col a colonial term, absolutely. Um, my specialty is, of course, Celtic studies. Um, so Ulster Plantation, Northern Ireland, is where Northern, um, where Scots were planted on the um, the Irish soil. That is why you have Ulster Plantation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are we Plantation, oh, plantation Plymouth, yep. was brought to an ugly head on um, the horrible show, The Bachelor. Well, I don't want to judge it, but. When that was like the downfall of one of the participants. They found pictures of her posing in costume as a plantation uh, lady. Have any yeah. has anybody seen that? No. no, no. It was quite controversial, mm -hmm. and it led to the firing of the director. You know, the show's host. Anyway, I don't watch it, but I watch news stuff that features that plantation is no longer an acceptable connotation is that what you're saying it's it, it it's it's has such strong connotations of oppression and and um taking away of people's rights that it's no longer being used it's no longer seen as a, an appropriate term do we have a similar um, concept here in new england i mean uh, we talked about like sydney and um Edward told us, you know, there weren't really the plantations here in New England, although there was slavery in other forms, but. There know. weren't the Southern agricultural plantations entirely, um, mm -hmm. basically labored over by enslaved peoples. But if you had a different climate and different soil, we could have, yeah, we could have been the South. Sure. Yep. There, there were plantations in the, in the early 18th century in, in southern Rhode Island that were large farms and had enslaved people, in, including in, in enslaved Africans there. So the, they, they weren't uh, the economic powerhouse that you found in the South, but they did exist here. Okay. That's, that's, I, won't, I was going to say that's good to know. That is not good to know, but it is useful and helpful to know. I know. Yeah. Uh, Roxanne, somebody's um, made a point about Saugus that the Scots prisoners were were allowed, you know, worked for seven years and yes. then came free, yeah. and they were white. Um, but I think, as we were discussing earlier, they're kind of, uh, you know, gradations of unfreedom. Yeah. 
the culminating in chattel slavery. Right. Um, so, but I wonder if you could say something then about Saugus and the situation. So I'm fascinated by Saugus. You spotted the word Scott in yes. there. That's mm -hmm. what got me interested in the Saugus stuff. I actually did a talk years ago to the descendants of some of those Saugus indentured servants or slaves, indentured well, servants. Well. Um, it's the Saugus Iron Works. And I called it servitude or slavery because I was trying to explore this issue. Um, for much of the 17th century, people who were involuntarily or voluntarily brought over as indentured bond servants um, were only indentured for a certain number of years, including very early on many of the African peoples. Um, there was a feeling that indenture, voluntary or involuntary indenture was seven years, maybe 12 years. The Saugus prisoner, the prisoners of war who came over, I would argue as, I personally think as slaves because it was completely involuntary, their, their deportation here and their labor, um, they received what I will call their freedom in seven years. They went on to become major members of society integrated into the New England Christian, I will call it white, though they didn't call it white then, society and some of their descendants are really powerful and important rich families here now. At the same time, people who were involuntarily brought over from Africa found themselves and their descendants longer and longer term bound as bond slaves, so that we saw in 1670 where the general court basically says, oh, those people, not the Saugus people, not mm. the Quakers who may have been sentenced to slavery, but the, at least the Africans, and I realize I don't know about the status of native peoples here, but at least the Africans were seen to basically have permanent slavery, permanent indenture, whereas chattel, white Christians chattel. were chattel. Right. They, and their children. Yeah. With the Indians, uh, a, a lot of it had to do with uh, uh, violations and indebtedness. Yeah. And they might start with seven years, uh, but uh, if they uh, weren't able to pay uh, certain debts, then yeah. their servitude would go on and on and on. Right. So it essentially became lifelong. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't chattel, though, in the sense of their children unless their children uh, got caught up in the same system. Thank you. That's what I've been wondering um, on very much so. Can I uh, interject here? They, um, they're recently doing uh, some excavating in Durham in North uh, uh, England. Yes. <clears throat> and uh, uh, they're finding huge uh, pits of bodies uh, that were... Um, Proof, I guess, that the indentured servants who made it to the Saugus Ironworks were the lucky ones. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Uh, I believe that they found mm -hmm. one massive grave with 3,000 uh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, bodies in it, and uh, they're continuing to uh, explore further this due to the fact that after the great military victory of Dunbar, all uh, which should be called the, Vic the Battle of Edinburgh, um, it, um, the, the uh, prisoners were marched south to Durham and died like flies on the way, and then uh, further died in imprisonment in Durham. Yep. So um, the lucky ones came to Massachusetts. Yes. And they, they knew they were lucky in some ways, in other ways, mm -hmm. you know, Luck doesn't mean that you agree with what happened. It's funny you used to call it the great victory at Dunbar. I realize I have such a Scottish perspective. I've always seen it as a dreadful defeat. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I just had never thought of it ever as a victory. Victory, but uh, yeah, they they were they they were marched to Durham Cathedral where they many died. It was acted as a hospital, as a place where they died, and then they were sailed down to London and they're um, kept captive in London for at least a number of months, and then some fifty of them were basically put on a ship and sent over to Saugus. And so I grew up in Durham, New Hampshire. And mm. I only found out very recently that my hometown of Durham, New Hampshire, I always wondered what was the connection to Durham, England. Durham, New Hampshire was essentially settled by several of the 
what I'm referring to is sort of the excess Saugus ironworks and dentured servants. Not all of the um, not all of them ended up in Saugus. Some went up to Dover and the Oyster River Plantation. Oh, there's that plantation again. Huh. Um, <laughs> and they named it Durham. So they apparently didn't think completely badly of Durham, maybe because it was a place to rest and try to regain your health. It's fascinating the way people um, were seen labor was seen as appropriately bought and sold. Some mm -hmm. people got rights and wealth eventually out of it. Others did not. There is a wonderful, um, I think it's a federal park that's been reconstructed at Saugus. Oh, I'm, I, yeah, it's a national park. Yep, that's where Very we did the Saugus conference and I used to do uh, um, cooking demonstrations over the uh, over the hearths and forges, the reconstructed hearths and forges there. Mm. It was a lot of fun. My spouse called it creative culinary incineration because we discovered that using oak charcoal, which is great for making wrought iron on, oak charcoal burns way too hot to actually cook over. Uh -huh. It was a lot of fun. Right. Roxanne, we're just getting up just yeah. almost 8.30. It uh, is indeed. Are there any final remarks anybody wants to make? Because you can always, you know, write to us by email or go on Facebook and continue the conversation. Yeah. But is there any final stuff in the chat? I, I put uh, a link to the website that I manage, uh, Soames Heritage Area. It's, it's all about uh, the, the Massasoit's hometown <laughs> and yeah. uh, what, what happened in the first 40 years after the Pilgrim's arrival. Oh, this is all going to be super. I have to look at this stuff. It would be super. So let's wrap up with, I'm going to go back onto um, share screen and we can let you know what our next great discussion is mm -hmm. going to be. Oops, and that was the wrong slide. Oh, because I went back to check the third slide there. Let me go back down to not this slide. Yes, this is the slide I want. Um, I think I'm just going to, well, no, I'll play it so you can see it large. So next up, in our discussion series. And thank you so much for making this a great discussion. On Wednesday, May 19th, Sarah Stewart, together with Frank Bremer, will be examining a 17th century life. Sarah, can you say a couple words about the 17th century English minister and how you are going to be exploring his life, how we are going to be exploring it? So, oh, I wish I had here the printed version of his diary because it's, you know, it's, it's a huge doorstopper. So I'm going to- it's Ralph Jocelyn is the name of the minister? Ralph Jocelyn. He was a minister in Essex in the kind of Puritan heartland. And it's a very rare case in which we can read somebody's own words about their life and their family and the weather and how the civil war is going and the approach of smallpox. So it mm. gives us a way in to all these aspects of a 17th century life yes. that we normally don't have. And I mean, I'll talk the a little bit about this. Of the oppressed. Sorry? I'm sorry? I think she was just commenting. Oh, okay. So we just, it's going to give us a way into looking at ordinary life and his care for his congregants mm -hmm. and the fear about, um, you know, smallpox and the plague approaching. And then also mm -hmm. like this, what are the social assumptions about the community in which he lives, his little Essex village in which he lives. And Frank Bremer, as you all know, is an expert in Puritanism uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, and he will be available for the finer point oh. of Puritanism, and I will talk more about medicine and health. And Neil, I hope you chip in to talk about Fra uh, Ralph Jocelyn too. I didn't have time to mention that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what's up next Wednesday, next May, next month on Wednesday the 19th. And since it's getting close to 8.30, let me go on to um, here, a little teaser Preamble. on our fall lecture series, which will be a series of six or so discussions. We've chosen this year the common good as the theme. And as I was reading through the general laws and preamble, what did I come across but the common good? 
So mm -hmm. I want to end sort of my end of the presentation here with oh, nice. a teaser on start thinking about the common good. If any of you meet with some law that seems not to tend to your particular benefit, you must consider that laws are made with respect to the whole people, nice. and not to each particular person. And obedience to them must be yielded with respect to the common welfare, not to thy private advantage. And as thou yields obedience to the law for common good, but to thy disadvantage, so another must observe some other law for thy good, though to his own damage. Thus mm. must we be content to bear one another's burden and so fulfill the law of Christ. Wow. So that's Very well. <laughs> what they are saying, the, the Puritans of the Commonwealth are saying about the common good, at least in the general laws in 1647. Oh. We've been exploring the rules to walk oh. by. So mull over. What rules do you think are the ones that society should walk by? What should individuals walk by? What is our common good and our responsibilities to each other? Thank you. That's my sort of, I guess, yeah, that, that's really the Massachusetts Commonwealth to you. Sarah, would you like to close us out with the last few comments? Yeah, just want to say, I think we should all unmute and give um, Roxanne a little applause. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Great. I think we've only just begun to think about these questions or not think about them, but to really delve into the primary materials and see what do they tell us. So that there's a lot more that could be said. Um, I want to say yes, do join us in May and then we're planning our next series for the summer as well. And uh, we'll be sending out a survey tomorrow. So please let us know. Are there problems? Are there things you like? Are there things you don't like? Did, could you not get into Zoom? You know, whatever it is, do you have ideas that we should be taking up? Let us know. So we always want to hear from you. So thanks a lot, everybody. <laughs>